This is the last of our chapters looking at system development and a software development life cycle. We've talked about systems analysis where we start out, figure out if we even can do a project or not. And then we've got into the buy, build, or outsource decision. Now we're going to talk more concretely about the actual design process of putting together a new computer system. So our objectives. We're going to talk about a couple of the different phases. So we have the conceptual design, the physical design. These are phases, conceptual ends up with our blueprint, and the physical design leaves us with an actual system. Then we're going to go ahead and implement the new system. That means go from a system that's installed on a developer's computer to a system that's actually being used on a day-to-day -day basis. This includes the conversion process. There are different ways to go from an old system to a new system. We're going to kind of discuss those elements. We'll also hit a little bit the system's operation and maintenance process. So the maintenance is the longest phase because the system's actually in use and we need to maintain new bug fixes or possibly new versions. So we look back to our initial diagram of the SDLC. We can see our five phases. In the systems analysis phase, we work to do the initial setup and our investigation and feasibility. And then we end up with a key decision point here of the go, no go decision. So again, the goal of this analysis is to do the minimum amount of work necessary for a good decision. Once that point is approved, then we get into the conceptual design phase. So at this point, we're thinking about design alternatives, such as buying it, building it, outsourcing it. And then we get into more conceptual design requirements. At the end of the conceptual phase, we should have some kind of system blueprint. After the blueprint's done, then we get into the physical design process. We're going to actually create the forms for our output, input. We're going to design some software algorithms for any data processing we need. And then, of course, design controls. When we're done with that, we should have a finished system. That system's still on developer's computer, though, so we're going to go ahead and make it go live now. Making it go live requires some kind of implementation plan. How do you go from a system on a developer's computer to one that's working properly with all of the users? This includes installing hardware and software, training people, testing, documentation, and then finally, an operational system working. Once the system's live, then we transition to the operation and maintenance phase. This usually involves bug fixes, so we find problems with the system, and as well as ongoing maintenance like new versions. So each of these phases, we can kind of break out into a little bit more detail. But you should go through each of these pieces and make sure you're really comfortable with each objective inside of each step here. And so again, looking at this analysis phase, we were doing feasibility and interest. We're doing studying the present system. We're doing cost and benefit analysis. And then we're talking about objectives and requirements. In the conceptual design, we have these three sort of breakout stages. Evaluate design alternatives prepare the specifications, and make our actual conceptual system design report. And so two things we can use that will kind of help us with this process. We have these general four steps, input, processing, storage, and output. It's helpful when we do this conceptual design to really sit down and think through each element. Let's take an example of someone ordering a cup of coffee from Starbucks. You might think, OK, for the clerk who's doing the sale, what information do they need to input? Well, it could be the cup. It could be the customer loyalty information. What kind of processing do we need? The processing might involve automatically decreasing inventory. It might involve adding credits to someone's account because they added some money to their, their Starbucks card. It include giving people loyalty points, a lot of different possible processing operations. Next up, we have storage. What information do we need? This might be records for daily sales. It could be records for individual customers of how much they purchased. And then for output, what do we need to do with the system? Output could include a simple receipt. It could include automatic daily reports to the manager. It could be emails, it could be dashboards, all kinds of things. And the idea is we want to define what all of these different pieces look like. What you'll probably find is as you define the output better, you'll have to go back and revise the input and processing. As an example, maybe as one of the outputs, you want to have some kind of record of sales by geographic region. Well, if you want that report, then you think about the input phase. You might need to capture someone's zip code information as well. Now, as we do this, we're trying to describe the goals of our system. What are we trying to accomplish here? 
And that way, when we get into physical design phase, our programmers can look at the goal we're trying to accomplish and decide how best to fit that goal. We're creating written documents. We're not creating code at this point in the process. And we're also going to create these things called use and test cases. A use case is a narrative or a description of what should happen. So example one test case could be I'm going to have a person come in who is overdrawn on their Starbucks credit card. Well, how does that resolve for the clerk's perspective? What can they do at that process? Now, these test cases are important because they describe the expected behavior of the system as well as any alternatives or, or error cases that we're going to have to deal with. Next, we had the physical design. For a physical design, we can kind of break this into a couple of pieces again. Now, again, these are sort of high-level view. Um, in an actual systems development class, this will be broken out, and we'll be talk about it in more detail. But this is sufficient to kind of give you an idea of what happens inside of this phase. So when we do the design, one of the common ways we can do this is start with the end first. So this is starting with the output first. So what you might do is put together, for example, a monthly report. Right. What should Starbucks store manager see as a profit and loss? Once you have that output, then you can go into the file and database design to figure out what fields you need to have and what information should be in each field. Then you can go into the input, what should be put into the system, get into any changes and processing. And then really it's important to talk about controls. How will you ensure that things are happening properly? So I had this scenario happen recently where I went to go buy a cup of coffee and at Starbucks, I just get a standard black coffee. Well, when I walked up, I asked for the coffee, the clerk handed it to me, and then I pulled up my credit card to pay. And she's like, no, that's fine, just take it. And which was an interesting interaction, because I was wondering, well, what's her motivation? Well, her motivation was, I don't really care enough to take your you know, $1.50 payment for this item. But from Starbucks' perspective, that's lost revenue. So obviously, uh, just a black coffee doesn't cost them very much. They're probably going to throw it away anyway because it was in the afternoon and they don't leave the coffee on the burner for forever. But that could also apply to someone's friend coming in. How do you make sure that someone's uh, extra low-fat mocha with almond whip and gold cream on it is actually charged up? And what are the processes that you can make sure that actually happens? So once we have all these designs, we actually will think about some of the reports that we need, like scheduled reports, special purpose, trigger exceptions, and on-demand. So scheduled reports, you might have those controls tie into a daily record of how many sales were made. You might think about special purpose reports, like maybe a monthly audit report. You might have an, a special exception saying that after inventory accounts, it's going to reconcile inventory accounts with sales records. And if they find they don't match, then they'll send off an email to the store manager or even an on-demand report where maybe a branch manager or regional manager wants to be able to find how much inventory loss there's been over the last month. So these are all things to kind of think about as you design these different elements. Now you can do it the other way around. You can do input first and then processing and program design and then get into the output. Um, but if you've got less experience, often it's really handy to start with the end result first because you don't really realize what you need until you look at the output requirements. So once you make the outputs, you can use this kind of list of questions to think about what they should look like. You know, who uses it? Is it online? Is it maybe printable? Um, are there pre-printed forms? Who gets them? How much detail should there be? And how often is it produced? When we look at file and database designs, we think about how we're going to store things. Uh, is it a manual process where I just tick something on a piece of paper? Do I do a daily or hourly batch process? Or is stuff going to be updated as soon as the clerk types it into their computer? We also want to think about size. How big will this database be? Because that'll help the programmers then appropriately size the back end of our systems. Most real world systems don't need to be that big. Uh, generally, you can fit most of a company's data into like a single nicely designed database server. But there are times when you need higher end equipment as well. For inputs, think about how you're going to get data into the system. What format is it in? Can you use things like barcode readers or OCR, optical character recognition, to transform a picture into actual data? You might think where data comes from, what format they're in, how often there is, who inputs it, and of course, cost. How do you make sure that this process happens easily and efficiently? 
So here's some other ideas for forms. Again, just good introductions on how to design a well-designed form. Okay, next. So we've got the physical design, meaning that we have an actual working system. It's been tested. We're pretty confident it's going to be okay. Now the question is, how do we make it go live? So we start off with the implementation plan. Our plan generally breaks into a couple of different approaches. We have phase, direct, parallel, and pilot that are different approaches for thinking through how to go live with it. We think about people. Who is going to be involved with this process? Who needs to be trained? We've got documentation for the users, developers, and maintainers of the system, and then we have some kind of test plan. Now for the implementation plan, we can kind of break it down to a couple of different approaches. The most uh, big or common approach is going to be what's called a big bang. Big Bang basically says we start with the old system and then we go to the new system. So typically you come in over the weekend and have your IT staff turn off the old servers, migrate the data over to the new system, and turn on the news. This is great because it is the least amount of cost and it's the easiest and cleanest way to cut over from an old to a new system. The danger here though is on Wednesday with a new system, you may discover that there's a problem or a bug. And generally, if there's a problem, it's very difficult to go back to the old system. So it's a very high risk approach. So that is the direct or the big bang approach. A phased approach and parallel approach are lower risk. So a parallel approach will say, keep the old system and then bring the new one on and run them both at the same time. So parallel, in other words, two systems running at the same time. Now, the advantage for this one here is that the old system is still up. So if anything goes wrong with a new system, I can just switch back over to the old system and I'm good to go. The problem is simply cost. I am having to duplicate all of my information entry, all my changes during this time when I have two systems running side by side. A middle ground is going to be the phased process. Phase says, I'm going to find a middle ground between the riskiness but low cost of the direct phase and the high cost and safety of the parallel phase. So phase means I'm going to take the system and break it into modules. And I'm going to bring online one module at a time so that if that module fails, I don't lose everything. So phase could mean I do one geographic location at a time. So again, if I'm Starbucks, I will bring online one store, test out the new system, and if everything goes bad, it's still okay, it's just one store. I could also break it up by module. So I might bring online our inventory module first, then our payroll module, then our receivables, and do it one module at a time. So all of these require more coordination and more work than the Big Bang does, but if something goes wrong, I've got much less risk. And lastly, we have a pilot phase. Pilot might mean I bring online a proof of concept to a single store and try it out. You can kind of think of it as a more direct kind of the phased approach. Um, but generally, I'm going to say the three big ones are phase, direct, and parallel. Those are the three I want you to remember. Let's talk about testing. Now, why is testing important? Well, if you look at bugs, we can kind of compare the, the occurrence or how likely they are to happen versus the cost of fixing them. So this is one particular example or one study that is estimating the cost of bugs at different points in the system. So their estimation says most of the bugs are created and found during the coding process, which makes sense. Typically, as you design something, you find a lot of errors as you actually work on it. But each error is relatively cheap to correct. However, the longer you wait, the more the cost of these increases. And again, these, these numbers are just like one example. They're not actually that accurate for you know, a global view of information system technology development and testing. Um, but it gives you a rough idea here of the different cost of magnitude. If you wait until after the release to find a problem, you're much less likely because you found most of the bugs already. However, the cost of fixing bugs is astronomically higher. And that cost includes not only the direct cost of programmers, but also lost productivity or even lost sales. So what are tests? Different tests could be walkthroughs. So a walkthrough says I have a use case that I've described of some sort of process. So if someone comes in, they put some money on their Starbucks card, they make an order, and then they get their coffee. I'm going to actually put that data into the system and make sure that it does everything properly. 
which means that I have the proper outcomes, I have data that's coming out, the reports look accurate, all that kind of stuff. I might also do test data. Test data says I'm going to plug in data from maybe the last year in the system and make sure that the new system gives me the same record and results as the old system does, and especially handling errors. I'm going to put in a whole bunch of garbage tests where the idea is that I want to make sure the system doesn't die or doesn't do something weird when I give it weird values. For an accounting, maybe I put in a negative number into a debit, or I put in an X, or I put in a gigantic number, or a very small number. Those are all different things you might put as user input. Acceptance tests means I go to my users and I have them use the data, or use the system, and try plugging in things and seeing what happens. And so usually this involves real data where they will, maybe for a day or so, try putting data into the system and kind of see what happens. So our conversion, we've kind of already talked about this in a general way. We have the direct conversion where we get rid of the old one and start with the new system. We can operate them side by side for a period of time. We can kind of gradually replace old with new, or we can sort of pilot with one part of an organization. And again, the big three are direct, parallel, and phase in. Those are the big ones I want you to remember. We also use the term big bang a lot for direct conversion because they do really well, but sometimes things blow up. And we look at these different stages, we can ask, well, how much time is spent on each of these different phases? Well, here's one study that tried to find out estimates of how long it took. So if the total time for a project, they found about 20% of your time is upfront in analysis. So if we're talking about you know, a year-long process, we're talking about spending several months of just trying to figure out what's actually happening in our real-world system, in our real-world process. This can be challenging because often management wants to see output. They want to see code. And so it's hard to convince people that you're doing productivity and you're doing good work when they don't see anything coming out of it. The design phase then says after we've looked at the, this processes and made sure everything is going to work, we started creating our physical design. So the physical or conceptual design, um, we're trying then to actually program the system out. We're getting more from abstract into detail, concrete working code. And that's a big chunk of this. The problem we have is typically projects run over time. And so at this phase in the process, you might just finish the design process, but you've blown through 80 or 90% of your time budget. And so these last two phases, implementation and test, tend to be very challenging. And so we look at testing phase. This is suggesting you spend roughly a quarter of your time on just testing the new system. That's, that's a lot. And it's sometimes it's hard to tell a development team who's already done a lot of work and already found a lot of bugs that there's probably still a lot of problems in their code that you have to go in and spend literally months analyzing. And implementation. How do you actually go live? And this, again, is a process that's easy to rush. And that's why a lot of immature organizations are tempted to do the big bang approach, where they just go live and they're out of budget, they're out of time, they've got to make it happen. But then they have a very high risk scenario because things could go very badly. All right, lastly, we have operations and maintenance. And one estimate had this as being roughly 75% of a project's budget, which again, huge amount of time and effort spent keeping these systems online and keeping them working. The problem we have, though, is that we've done all of this work to analyze, make the design, program it, go on live, and people are tired and they're often ready to move on to something new. Operations and maintenance is never that exciting, and so it's hard to get people focused on it. One of the best things you can do, though, is do a review after you implement code. And the idea here is that you want to learn as an organization. You want to get together in a room and talk in a non-judgmental way about what happened and what we can learn from the last couple of months or last couple of years. This is important because you need to not put blame. Instead, you, you need to think about how can we learn and not repeat mistakes we made in the past. And most software implementations are custom, unique, one-off things, so you're always going to have some mistakes and some newness with any new system development. So there's some different questions you can ask. You can say, did it meet the goals? Uh, were users happy with it? Did you get the benefits? Is it reliable? Is it compatible? Did we handle errors well? So there's a lot of different things you can do during this sort of post-implementation review phase. So these are some key terms you should be familiar with as we look at this chapter, but I want you to go back and think about the overall process we did here. We have this SDLC, and we talked about it now for three different chapters. 
We've done the systems analysis phase, going to the go, no-go decision. We've thought about how to do the conceptual design, whether to build it in-house, to outsource, or just to buy a system. And then this chapter has talked a lot about the last three modules, the physical design, implementation, and operations and maintenance. Remember, too, that we've kind of talked about this like a waterfall process. But a lot of organizations these days are going to use an agile process where they flip through multiple cycles here. So you might do this entire SDLC once for each module or once for each location. Um, but you'll find often that this circling is a more efficient use of your time. And it's efficient because we want to spend a lot of time learning. Anytime you do a software project like this, the things you don't know are always bigger than you expect. And so learning how to deal with that kind of challenging problem is a really key organizational goal. But hopefully this SDLC gives you a framework for how to approach these problems and some basic questions to ask when you have this happen in your organization as well.